agreed to contribute to this most necessary conversation. We can all agree that um, policing today does look different than it did just a short time ago, but there are still issues that still remain that we would like to uh, continue the community's discussion as it relates to this. So um, we just want to go ahead and get started uh, with the order in which the mayor's office, the Metro Police Department, then the Community Oversight Board. As you come, you, uh, you did receive questions that we'd like for you to address. And then uh, the seated commissioners may have questions afterwards. Again, we thank you for your time to come and join us. And we would ask now for the representative from the mayor's office. Okay, we'll keep this thing moving. Uh, representative from the police department. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Lada uh, from the Metro National Police Department's Office of Community Outreach and Partnerships, and I appreciate you letting me be a part of this, uh, this discussion. So as I was reading the questions, um, I was really excited about them because I think it really helps to highlight the great work the police department is doing and, and how far we've come. Uh, when we start looking at um, what Chief Drake has done since he's gotten here, he's really instituted three pillars since he started the department, uh, started working as the chief of the department, organizational excellence, community engagement, and precision policing. And those are the three pillars that he is focusing all of our efforts on, and they exemplify what we strive to do as our community, in our communities and how we serve them. So the first question, when you look at the methods and processes that we use to respond to and incorporate feedback from uh, the public, there's def several different things that we do. We, we work a lot of, we do a lot of community meetings. Uh, that's one of the big ones we do, a WebEx meetings. We go through social media, um, emails that we get directly from the community itself um, and our community members. And we also uh, speak directly with those community members face to face as well as through community leaders. Um, a lot of the people that we, we work with, um, some of them don't speak uh, English as their first language, so we go through community leaders that they have to, to help uh, relay the information that they want from us. Once we take that information, we really start analyzing and looking at it to see what it is that they're really getting, uh, trying to tell us, is there anything that we need to change? Is there anything that we need to do differently? And then we really analyze that information and once we do that, we start to look at what changes need to be implemented. And we do that through policies. We do that through um, getting information out to the officers through roll call trainings. We do it through roll call uh, each, each day. Uh, the officers go to roll call and their supervisors tell them what our focus is on for each day. Um, we also do it through um, in-service training, which we do every year, and every officer has to go through that. And we incorporate these things into those trainings in any other manner we deem appropriate. When I look at the second question, this is one that I think is really important, is uh, with the new department liaisons to the community, what actions are being taken on the ground? Um, the officers with boots on the ground, I think, is one of the most important parts of this, uh, the, the information we want to give out. Um, every, first of all, every officer is a liaison for the department. Every time they go out to their communities to serve, they're a liaison between the department uh, and the community. At the precinct level, we have zone officers uh, who work out in specific areas. We have community coordinators and community engagement teams. And on a countywide level, we have other different divisions and units focused on spe a specific criminal and quality of life issues. We've got the Special Victims Unit, uh, which focuses on human trafficking, New Neighborhood Safety Unit, which uh, focuses on drug-related crime as well as drug overdose investigations through our Community Overdose Response Team, which, by the way, we had 450 confirmed overdose deaths this year, and they're, uh, they're out there really trying to investigate those. Um, we have uh, our Family Intervention Program, which works with vulnerable groups uh, and provides resources to them. We have the Office of Alternative Policing Strategies, which is working with our partner partners at the Mental Health Co-op um, and focusing on the crisis intervention team, uh, working with uh, or assisting subjects suffering from mental health crisis. Uh, and we also have the SROs in schools to help connect them with our, our, connect with our youth and keep them safe, just to name a few. Our first goal is always addressing safety and crime issues. And the way we do that is many of the, the officers on the ground, the, the community coordinators, the community engagement teams, and all of the officers in the units, we do things such as community site surveys, conducting site surveys for businesses and organizations. 
We help form neighborhood watch groups, conduct all types of community meetings to help educate how to protect ourselves uh, from a, being a victim of a crime, from things uh, such as fraud to things such as violent crime. We conduct active shooter training for churches uh, and organizations. We're supplying Narcan for over drug overdoses to businesses and organizations and to help with drug overdoses. We're supplying educational materials in different languages. Again, these are just a few of the things that we're doing. Um, we also have our community, uh, Office of Community Outreach and Partnerships uh, in the liaison, which I'm blessed to be a part of that office. Um, and the, some of the liaisons we have is to the Hispanic community, the Kurdish community, the Asian community, LGBTQ community, displaced community, as well as several, several others. We're working closely with the leaders in these communities, uh, and they're really helping guide us to telling us what's working, what's not. What are the issues in those communities, and how can we serve them better? And so I think that's a really important partnership that we have uh, through this office. Right now, we currently have two sessions of the Citizens Police Academy running. One of them is the first Hispanic Citizens Police Academy, uh, which is awesome because now the Latino community, which for so long had a fear of the police, are now learning how we, how we work. And so they're getting the inner understanding of why police do some of the things that they do. And it's helping to, them to understand um, who we are and helping us bridge that gap between the police department and the, that Hispanic community. Apart from the crime issues, we're also working to get resources out to the most vulnerable community members through many amazing partnerships that we have um, in the different generous organizations in Nashville. We've partnered with Lowe's, The Goodness Project, uh, Creative Girls Rock, Boys and Girls Club, National Noticias, Metro Parks, Girls Incorporated, Equity Alliance, Tennessee Children's Services, Mental Health Co-op, um, the Mayor's Office, uh, the Metro Government uh, Community Safety Coordinator, Mr. Ron Johnson, who's gonna speak. Um, we've had so many great people that have worked with us. Uh, the department has, had, has been a part of over 730 community engagement events throughout this year. These have, uh, events have been attended by over 84,000 people. Um, and you can look at this information up at the dashboard. Uh, if you look on our Metro Government webpage, it has a dashboard with a lot of different uh, information that you may wanna see. And one of them is community engagement. Some of these community engagement uh, events have been back to school bashes where we coordinated with different partners and we would give out not a thousand backpacks, um, a oh, thousand backpacks in over nine locations. We've given out, uh, you know, hygiene giveaways at Love's truck stops. We've gone to uh, various schools and set up hygiene and food pantries uh, to st students in need. We've worked with mother to mother, handing out diapers. Um, I like to thank, actually, uh, I have it here, you know, Open Table, who's given us uh, a resource guide, you know, that we hand out during all Christmas baskets. We're going to be serving over 300 uh, families for Christmas baskets, and this is something that we're giving out to them so that they can find the resources that they need. Um, we've had uh, trunk or treat events. Today we received a bunch of candy, which is gonna make a lot of kids happy, um, through Cornerstone Church that provided that for us. Again, these are partnerships that we're building with them, uh, with different organizations. One of the really cool ones that we've had is the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, the Caring Police Respond Initiative, CPR program. We've blessed over 1,000 families with over $150,000 worth of assistance during their times of crisis. That's a lot of families that are being assisted during the worst moments of their lives. And, and that is one of the things that we're looking at is we're not only focusing on crime prevention, but we're also helping people with their quality of life. We want to make sure that they have the basic necessities that they need, which many don't have here in the city. Um, you know, we're constantly looking at different ways to serve. We're constantly looking at ways that uh, to grow. We're going to our community members and community leaders and figuring out what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Where do we need to change? And we're taking that information and then we're using it to see what, what changes we need to implement. And Chief Drake has been very, very clear that um, you know, we're gonna continue to serve as best we can uh, and we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that the city's safe. And so I know that time's running out. Uh, I'm learning to keep going there, but I, I just wanna make sure that everybody knows that you know, there's a lot of things that the police department is doing. Um, there's so many other things that I, you know, I wouldn't have enough time here to speak, but uh, I do want to let you know that if, if you have any questions, um, my email is carlos.lara at nashville.gov. My cell phone is 615-864-5751. You can call me. We will give you all the information that you need. Um, we will help in any way we can. And again, these are just a few of the things that we're doing to try to move forward in, in reimagining the way the policing is done. So I appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there any questions from commissioners? Y yes, Ms. Burton. Ms. Burton. Is it Officer Lada? Uh, 
It's, it's Commander Lara. Commander it's, it's Carlos, Lara. It's but it's very, Commander it's very uh, nice Commander Lara. Have you here. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I appreciated hearing uh, some of the things you had to say about community, um, some of the community involvement things. I wanted to know, do you know the percentage of officers of color that you have in the um, under? Um, well, in the department, do you know active officers of color? I don't have that information in front of me, but I can get it for you. Um, okay. Also, if you want, you could go to the dashboard right now. Okay. And I could probably look it up in the dashboard no, no, on I'll Metro Government. Up. And it actually has a breakdown of all of the races, all of the ranks, how many officers we have. Again, it's at the dashboard at, at metronational.gov. Great amount of information on there that if that could answer that, ma'am. I should have looked it up. Thank no, you very much. No, no problem. Much. I apologize. I don't have it with me. It's okay. Um, I, I wanted to ask specifically about uh, your community strategies, not just for um, citizens, but for the police department. Are you having the kind of uh, training with police officers that would help them understand why communities may have some fear of them? So there are a lot of things, nice things that are happening. But for example, in North Nashville, there is over-policing. In okay. South Nashville, there's over-policing. Are there, is there training for officers on understanding the history of why communities may not be as trust, trusting of mm -hmm. them? Yes, ma'am, and so that's a great question. So we are doing the mobile diversity uh, seminar, I think it's, it's considered, but it, they go to different areas. The officers, especially the training, the ones that are in training right now, they'll go to different areas. They'll go to a mosque, they'll go to, um, the, I think, the play uh, nightclub, and then they'll go to uh, Conexión Américas. They'll go to different areas where there's different um, groups, mm -hmm. and you'll learn about the history of where we're at and why we've gotten here. Uh, we've got different trainings, uh, fair and impartial policing. We've got some diversity training that we have, uh, different classes that we give, not during, not only uh, during in-service, but also during uh, uh, the, the the supervisor schools that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we're constantly looking at the better training. What, what can we do to really help officers understand where we've been and where we've come, and why you know why people react to us the way they do. Um, there's a lot of training that we do, and in that training, we're constantly trying to figure out um, how we can teach them to understand first of all why they react, and then um, have some empathy and know that you know this is not a uh, something that happened overnight. This is something that has decades of of trauma that people have had to suffer, and how we can deal with that as officers and being respectful to them. One more question. Sure. Are they evaluated on how well they respond um, with regard to different communities? So, for example, if there's a problem, mm -hmm. do, does that affect their evaluation, a police officer's evaluation, if they have a negative, um, if they have a negative encounter with a community and it is, it is believed mm -hmm. that it may be racially motivated, class motivated, language motivated, are police officers evaluated on that? And does it affect their uh, evaluation, pay grade, suspension, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So officers, if, if somebody calls into the police department with a, a complaint on the way an officer, um, I guess, treated them, or if they feel that something was racially motivated or anything like that, the, invest the officers, supervisors investigate that. Mm -hmm. And if it comes out that, yes, it was racially motivated and something was not done properly, then the, the officer will, uh, will have to deal with this, uh, discipline. Uh, depending on what the what the chief decides to do in that situation, but um, I think 100% we're not going to tolerate that. If if somebody's you know shows that they're having a pattern of discrimination or they're showing that they are doing things um, in a way that is not legal or unethical, um, we have no problem making sure that that's taken care of and dealt with. And if they don't need to be here, then they won't. Um, so I think that that's something that when you're talking about evaluations. Um, it's kind of hard to evaluate unless somebody tells you, right. uh, you know, that there's an issue. But if an officer or if a supervisor or another officer sees that something is being done mm -hmm. in a way that they feel is being racially motivated, unethical, uh, or anything like that, they bring it to their supervisor, and the supervisors will take the proper steps to investigate that. And again, if it comes out that something is not being done right, we will deal with it accordingly. So the way it's supposed to work is there should be a con some consequences for that to happen. One hundred percent. If there's policies written about bias-based policing, um, and if those are not followed, then they will deal with uh, whatever issues, whatever the consequences are for the actions that they they, they will be held accountable. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Commander Lauda. Uh, appreciate uh, your thoughts. I wanted to help uh, uh, Commissioner Burton. Since uh, you didn't have it on hand, I, I looked it up. Uh, the department is 82% white and 89% uh, male. 
uh, Commander Lauda, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, Nashville has the highest incarceration rate in the country. We have the zip code that has the highest incarceration rate. Dozens of sexual assault allegations in the department. Uh, black women officers on the record alleging that they have faced retaliation for criticizing the department. Um, multiple killings of unarmed members of the community. Uh, Chief Drake's reforms seem uh, too little, uh, too late. As a commissioner, I don't think that uh, MNPD has demonstrated that it has the capacity to police itself. So my question to you is, will MNPD accept a mandate from the city that will give subpoena powers, supervising powers, and the power to fire officers to the Community Oversight Board, which as it is right now, has very, very limited powers. That's, thank you for the question. Um, I'm gonna say that I, have, uh, I can't answer that question because I don't have that information. That's something that um, only Chief Drake would be able to answer and that's something that um, would be addressed to him. And I can get that, that to him, but I will not answer on behalf of the department because I'm, uh, I, I don't know what the Chief, uh, uh, the chief well, wants to answer that. Well, I, I understand that. Is there a way that uh, we can uh, get a uh, uh, public response from Chief Drake on that issue since it's a pretty important one? Uh, that's something that you would probably have to address with his office. Can you facilitate uh, us addressing your office uh, to receive that answer? I will go back uh, to the, the chief's office and, and let him know your concerns and see how he wants to respond. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Are there any other comments or questions? I have a, oh, sorry. I have a quick one. Make sure. Okay. Uh, just really quickly, uh, thank yes, you for your comments and for being here today. Um, I guess uh, what I'm confused about is, um, and I came in a little bit late, but this relationship uh, with the, poli the police department between the community and my commissioners uh, addressed this somewhat. But, um, you know, you, you talked about if a, if a complaint comes up, if something is brought to the attention of the police, then something is supposed to be done about it. And I know nothing about the union contract and how they're absolved of things, but the question here, and I think the reason we're asking about community is that um, there is some sort of information or knowledge on the police officer's behalf about what the community needs and is going through and is experiencing and all these things. If there is no trust, so you know, I, I appreciate MMPD kind of doing some pseudo charity and some pseudo poverty alleviation. I don't think that that's the role, but if there is, uh, what really needs to happen is some sort of communication so information is gained from the police op to the police officers about what these people are going through. And if there's no trust and there's no relationship, then how is anyone ever gonna let you know, not you, but the department, mm -hmm. that something has gone wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, I would be ter terrified to even make a call or to put in an anonymous note mm -hmm. um, because I'm scared of you um, and the institution. So I guess what I'm saying is like I, I appreciate church donating candy and you know bags and open door, all of that. I think that that to me indicates some confusion of strategy of how to interact mm -hmm. with community because that doesn't that seems really piecemeal and not overall so I'm wondering uh, do you understand that aspect of it not just you but from what you understand from your institution that that's the issue at hand here yes ma'am thank you for that comment so when we look at building relationships it's not something that's done overnight um, and then that's something that we're working very hard to do um, that is done I think through many different things that the chief has already implemented from policy changes to um, different um, creation of different divisions to try to address some of those issues. Uh, we've also looked at our office, the Office of Community Outreach. One of the things that we focus on is working with the communities that we've never had a real good relationship with, Hispanic community, um, the, the uh, Kurdish community, which is the largest Kurdish community in the country outside of Kurdistan, Asian community, LGBTQ. We've got liaisons to try to start working with them to build that trust. We can't really get a lot of information if we don't build that bridge first, and that's what we're trying to do right now through, again, um, connecting with the leaders in there. You know, I've, I've talked to the Somali, the leaders in the Somali community, the leaders in the, in the Ethiopian community, which is a huge uh, community out here, and we're trying to figure out what is it that we need to do, because the cultures are different. What is it that we need to do to gain the trust of those people, and then they will start calling us. And so it's not something that's gonna happen overnight, it's something that's gonna take some time, 
we're working on it right now by, again, trying to start to build those relationships, open the uh, lines of communication, start be being part of the community and going out. You know, one of the things that I heard when I first uh, started working with the, the Kurdish community is, you guys only show up when things are, things are going wrong. I don't ever see you guys when, when stuff's going right. Why don't you come to any of our events? So what do we start doing? That's what they're telling us. We're gonna start going to events. We start going through and visiting the, the businesses, talking to the, to the leaders uh, in that community, and they're introducing us to others. That's how we start to make, uh, make way for partnerships. I think it's that open line of communication, serving them, making sure that when they call us that we, we do our very best that we can so that they are taken care of, uh, making sure that they we're uh, available when they need it. We're getting calls now that we didn't get in the past. People calling us directly. You know, I've had, I had a, a Kurdish uh, woman call me directly and say, hey, I got this number. I just want to let you know that you see, we're having a domestic violence issue. And she said, I wish you guys would, uh, would come out because there's more females that are needing this help. And I'm happy that she's now able to talk to me when she wasn't able to talk to anybody in the past. There's, there are things that we're doing that, again, are not going to be overnight fixes. It's going to take a while for us to get that real good partnership and real good trust with the communities, but we're working on it and we're moving forward. So again, uh, I wish I could say that this is an easy fix, but we've had a lot of many years of issues that we're trying to, to mend, and Chief Drake is doing the very best he can with what he has to try to do that. And he's constantly trying to figure out what are better ideas that we can do, what, what can we do? And then he's implementing those things. I don't know if that helps uh, as clear as mud, uh, but it, again, <coughs> We um, had a lot at five minutes for questions, and we've let it go on a minute. And I'm going to go ahead and let Irwin, who's been waiting, Commissioner Vinnick, who's been waiting, to um, ask his question. Commissioner Miller, thank you very much for being here today. Yes, I have two questions. Sure. First, uh, I'd like you to describe for me as best you can uh, how how you perceive or how the department perceives its relationship with the Community Oversight Board. That's the first question. The second question is, I'd like, if you could, to uh, tell us a little bit about what initiatives have been or are being developed by the Office of Alternative Policing Strategies. Sure. The first question, uh, Chief Drake has made it very clear that he respects the board. Uh, it was voted on by over 100,000 people, and he understands that they have a role, and we respect that role. Um, I think Chief Drake has been very clear that Again, we're, we want to make, uh, we don't want to stand in the way of the, of the board Excuse doing me their a job. minute, Commander. Yes, sir. If I could just say this to just save time and offer just a little bit of clarity. Yes, sir. Commissioner Vinnick wanted to know how does the police department, so I guess from you being an officer, not speaking on behalf of Chief Drake, but how do you, what, what does the COB mean to you and to officers? What, what does that represent to you? Well, like I can say I can't, I can't speak for the officers because everybody's different and well, everybody has their own yourself, thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm the COB liaison, so um, I'm going to speak on my, my, uh, my opinion of it is that we're here to serve uh, and help facilitate the COB so they can do their job without any uh, roadblocks. And that is what we've been trying to do. Um, you know, uh, I'm in constant communication with the with the director Fitchard and Assistant Director Clossy, and trying to make sure that they have what they need. And I think that that is what our focus is: making sure that they uh, don't have any roadblocks, that they have all the resources that the police department has, so that they can do their job. And that's, I think that's the answer there. Um, Office of, of, of uh, Alternative Policing Strategies. Right. So they have a juvenile diversion that they're working on. Um, the CIT program, which is the the crisis intervention team, which uh, they work with uh, co jointly with the uh, mental health co-op, and also the the uh, gun take back, um, which is a, a program that I'm not a, I don't have enough information on, so I don't want to talk too much about that. It's still in the works, um, but I tell you the CIT program has been working very well. I think that uh, it's been a great um, partnership with mental health co-op, and it is uh, really uh, really helping as we move forward to serve those who are having mental health crisis. Um, out in the field, and so I think it's it's something that was needed, and necessary, and then it's out there and it's working. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Commander, for your time. And it's obvious that there's quite still a bit of communication and clarity that is needed uh, between the community at large and your department. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, can yes. I just add one more thing? 
And one of the concerns that I have is that what I've heard you say today is talking about building trust with new communities in Nashville, and I appreciate that. I'm a member of a very old community in Nashville, and the African American community has been here a long time. Some Latino community has been here for a long time, and there's still not trust. And it's not just about not knowing. Um, um, one way to build trust is not trunk or treat. It's treating communities with dignity and respect. And it's also when there is a complaint that that complaint is handled with integrity. And that is not what we have seen. And that's why we're here. And so while I appreciate everything that you have said, I think the message needs to be delivered that this is not just a matter of not knowing. It is a matter of it coming to our attention and some people having firsthand knowledge that the police department as a whole has not demonstrated respect for the African American community, for some of the Latino community um, who have been here for a long time. And so it's not just a matter of we don't know the police and so we, we don't understand and we don't understand what they do. Like in some other countries, they have different uh, different kinds of encounters with the police, but I think it needs to be delivered that, you know, as my sister said here, you know, that the, the charity model is fine, but dignity, respect, and responsiveness is what, what we're concerned about. Thank you. I just want to say that absolutely, and that's something that I think has been very clear that we're, we're trying the very best to make sure that we always treat everybody with dignity and respect. Now, is that something that we can show? I, I don't know how we would show that, but we're, that's something that the chief all the way from the top down has stressed and has really shown that we will treat people with dignity and respect. Um, he has the, the, uh, the motto of uh, do no harm. And again, that is what we're pushing down. Um, we're doing our very best with what we have. And again, there's, we're not saying that there can never be changes and we can't, we can't do better. We can always do better, always, no matter when. Uh, but we're doing the very best we can with what we have right now. And I think we're, making a, we're in a lot, much better place today than we were uh, before he got here. Thank you again. Thank you. At this time, um, we'd like to hear, uh, I see that Mr. Johnson is here from the mayor's office. All right, uh, you have seven minutes to share with us. Okay, start that again. I am Ron Johnson. I am the community safety coordinator in Mayor John Cooper's office. I was appointed to this position back uh, May 19th, and I've been um, Working uh, in our community here since 1985, I actually started this the work that I'm doing now uh, at Martha O'Brien, working in the inner city, working with young people uh, for quite some time. I've worked with uh, gang intervention um, quite a bit. Uh, I ran a program, helped start a program with the Oasis Center called the Real Programs for Reaching Excellence as Leaders. We work with young people there alongside the juvenile court. We had a about a 15% uh, non-recidivism rate during that time. And um, from my understanding from, from uh, Mr. John Bunton as the mayor I decided they wanted to create this uh, community safety partnership program, uh, I was vetted and asked if I would uh, join the mayor's office to help uh, try and find ways to bring our city together. And as I so and spoke with them, and I say to us, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to change our city is truly bringing the village together. And that was kind of one of the things that I've done um, with bringing some of the young people that I had worked with throughout the city together to where they was able to change some of their behaviors and go on and do some amazing things and continue to do some amazing things. And so now what we've done with this community safety partnership program, we have gone and tried to, uh, um, uh, we, we had an opportunity grant that we put out uh, to some of the smaller nonprofits where they were able to apply for a $5,000 grant. Uh, we had maybe 30 or so uh, smaller uh, agencies to apply. Um, we had some that was a, 
a little bit larger that applied, but we, you know, we didn't discriminate. You could apply if you, you were a nonprofit and was interested in being a part of, of helping combat violence. And what we did, we had 11, 11, 11 people uh, advisory board who advised us to make some of those decisions on passing out those $5,000 grants. And one of the other thing, once the board uh, approved it, we sent it to council and council approved 20 of them. And so right now it is going through legal process to um, get those funding out to those uh, nonprofits. But in the meantime, what I've done is, is reach out to those nonprofits and continue to communicate with them, go and sit with them, because as I would say to them, I am one of them. Uh, I totally did the same thing. I worked in, and operated from a small nonprofit perspective. Uh, I know what it's like not to have. I know what it's like to. Um, Mr. Johnson, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Please mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, but just in the interest of time, more specifically, we'd like to know, as we look at reimagining public safety in okay. your role in the mayor's office, what are some initiatives? Uh, what are those grants to do? How is this, what you're doing, going to help uh, public safety in Nashville? So one of the things that, that we, we thought about when we looked at you know, public safety, we knew that you know, most of the smaller nonprofits are working, operating in what you call silos. Uh, they're not doing much of the work that needs to be done. I, I truly believe that when you think about a village and working and operating together, that's kind of where I came in and went out and met with some of these nonprofits and talked to them about what it would be like if we're able to help you reach, say if you're seeing five young people or serving five young people, what would you be able to do with this $5,000? And so each one of them applied and said they'd be able to do these. These are very small things. That's the thing that I always say. Money will not be what will change it. I think passion, love, and care would be what will truly change it. But if we can get them to work together and, and come out of the silos, and those groups that we have uh, approved have agreed to do just that. But that's just the beginning uh, because after that, that, that uh, $5,000, we have an implementation opportunity grant that will be uh, uh, out sometime by the first of the year. That's, that's my understanding. That's through another uh, area of our office. An implementation grant is going to be anywhere from 50000 or more for those nonprofits. But what the 5000 does is, uh, is for those organizations who are smaller and all those organizations who uh, are willing to work together because they, they're, they're, the funding that they have is very small and they're going to come together and we're going to work with them with some of the training with the CNM um, and also with uh, helping them understand violence together with some of the different trainings that we will provide to them. Uh, we'll be working on uh, CBT. That's one of the things that we're asking them to do, cognitive behavioral therapy, get at least two of their people from their staff because we know that behavior is truly centered around the way we think. Uh, those are the things that we're doing with those smaller guys. Now, the other things are when we get those bigger groups, those bigger groups are going to have a bigger responsibility, who, those who get the bigger grants. Their responsibility would be a lot um, bigger than the smaller uh, organizations. Um, I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anything. That's really that's that's kind of what we're doing, and and you know, and that's really in a very small way. But at the same time, I think once we're able to get those implementation grants to some of those bigger organizations, and everything is kind of you know, it's been slow. I, I've come in thinking I could sprint and get a lot of these things done, and realizing that this is truly a marathon. It's truly a marathon. Some of the trainings that I've gone to, like with the Urban Peace Initiative, with those guys who are doing the work in L.A. and in Chicago, they've told me that it's taken them 10 years to get to this position that they're in to make some of the impacts that they're making. But we have to start somewhere, and that's kind of where we've started at. If I could just ask you one question, then I'll open it up to the commissioners. Um, just real briefly, if you're successful at your job, what will you accomplish? If I'm successful at my job, what will I accomplish? I truly believe that, to me, I believe the murder rate would go down because 
we will be able to affect behavior. And if we affect behavior in the thinking process of those young people that are committing some of those crimes, that is what I believe will go down. I truly believe that by helping those people who've worked in silos come together and work together, who are on the front line, who haven't had these types of opportunities, who I know without a doubt were given this opportunity can do a whole lot more and will do a whole lot more because they've been doing it for free. So that's where I would believe we'd be able to see success in young people's behavior. Okay, thank you, sir. Are there any questions from commissioners? Commissioner Vanek. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much for being thank here you. today. Could you tell us some of the nonprofits who are getting some of these $5,000 grants? And that's the first part of the question. The second question is, is that, uh, are those grants or are those programs uh, being coordinated at all through the uh, Office of Alternative Policing Strategies in the Police Department? Uh, no, they are not through the Alternative uh, okay. Policing Strategy. Those grants are through our legal department and our uh, finance department. Okay. And some of the organizations that are getting those grants are, you know, organizations like um, uh, Before and After Girls Rock, um, um, I mean, uh, gents, uh, we have organizations like, uh, oh wow, I can't even remember this, 615, uh, before and after 615, Girls Inc., God, I cannot think of all 20 of them, but there, there are 20 I know for sure. Could you get a list of those to us? I can get a list Definitely. to you guys, yes. And, uh, and do I understand that they're essentially following up on your prior experiences in terms of gang intervention? Is that, you know, I mean, I guess the terminology there is violence interruption. Is that, is that what this is, what these grants and what these programs are intended to do? Well, no, this partic these particular programs are not centered around violence interruption. Uh, that is a whole different uh, uh, group program. Uh, that's from our GBI. Uh, we're hoping to, to launch and working and having, you know, the right type of messengers, young people who may have been engaged and involved in guns and violence who've changed their life. And those are going to be totally different from this particular type of program. These programs here are going to work specifically with organizations who have already been doing the work uh, on the front line and just need a little bit of boost, a little help uh, to do more or to, to you know. Are, are there programs being funded now to support violence interruption programs in impacted communities? No program has received any funding at this time as yet. Uh, you know, everything is, like I said, I wish this was a sprint because that's the kind of work that I've done when I worked in the public sector. This right now has been, you know, Hurry up and wait. Uh, and n not that it's anything wrong with that, but when you're dealing with, uh, I would say, taxpayers' money, you have to make absolutely sure that you vet the organization, that you make absolutely sure that they're doing what they say that they are doing, and then that's when legal, finance, and all of those people will sign off on those, those types of funding. Are there, yes, uh, Commissioner Salazes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your work, what, what you do every day. Um, I am reflecting on the fact that uh, you mentioned there are uh, 20 organizations uh, that, that received a $5,000 grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, well, that amounts to about $100,000, um, whereas the, the police department uh, gets $289 million a year. And uh, I, I, I wanted to highlight that very, very stark difference because we're doing a lot to, to punish people and very little to prevent and to resource people. And uh, um, at the same time, these uh, grants are going to uh, organizations in a way that seems fairly decentralized, and perhaps you can confirm that for me. So my question is, is the mayor thinking at all about institutionalizing public safety, uh, especially for people that uh, have been shot out of, of the systems that, that already exist? Is the mayor thinking about institutionalizing public safety? Yes, in, in, uh, in uh, preventative uh, 
uh, non-punitive oriented ways? Well, I would say, you know, this process is, uh, you know, and this is just me speaking from someone who's done this work for a long time, uh, has not been as fast as I would like for it to be, but I say that without any shadow of a doubt, I truly believe that we can get it done. I truly believe that it's gonna take us all. There's no way that this work can be done by no one group, no one organization, no one entity. I truly believe that without the village coming together, and that's all of us, it's not gonna happen, period. It's not gonna happen. I agree with you. Um, and how much money does the village need? I, you know, this is the thing that I, I will, that there's no amount of money that you can place on a life that's lost. None, zero. So that would be an endless amount. My experience is one that would be proved of that. My mom was murdered. And so I truly understand what some people are dealing with and going through in these streets when they lose a loved one. So there's no amount of money that you can put in to make me know and to help me through some of these things. But here's the thing I think that what some money can do. If I'm seeing and providing a service for five people who may possibly be engaged with guns and or violence, and I can see 10 because I got $5,000, that's 10 people that may not end up having to go through what I went through or what somebody else's parent or brother or sister have to go through. So it's not, I think it's not a, it's not a number, but if, if it was up to me, it should, we, yeah, we need a lot more, but it's what we have, and I think we have to work with what we have until we can prove that we can get it done or show that it, can, it is possible with what little, because with, I think with a little, and you show that you can do with what a little, a lot, then I believe the resources will come. That's kind of how I've come into this position. I didn't take this job because of money. I took this job because it's who I am. And so therefore, regardless of how much money that gets poured into it, it's me pouring me into it, and that's why I believe it can be done. I hope I answered that. I'm yes, sorry. Commissioner Abafat. <laughs> uh, hi, Ron. Thank you so much for being hey. here. Um, I've got uh, two questions. Uh, you come from a ton of experience of what works and what doesn't work, right? That's why you've True. been high into this. And I guess what I'm wondering is, one, what would you say is the priority of this for the mayor's office? Um, and it's a hard question, just off the, you know. <laughs> I'd like to know what you would say Well, I, I would say the priority to this is to get it done. That is really the but priority. But where does it sit? Well, like, I mean, it's hard to, to kind of rank anything on the tolling pole. I don't know. To me, it's number one. And that, that, therefore, there's no, there's, no, there's no ranking because I know what it feels like when it comes to losing something very dear to you. So that's the ranking that I would put it. And so, therefore, when I come to work, that's what I put into it every day. Now, as far as the mayor, I would say... It's high on his list as well because here's what I, the reason I say that is, if it wasn't, why would you bring somebody like me in? Because I'm not going to put it in. It's not me just doing a job. This is me being who I am. So I would say it would be high on his list because you brought somebody in like me. But I would really think that would be a question to ask him. But if I had to answer it, I would say it has to be high because he brought somebody like me in. Okay, thank you. And then I'm the sorry. second question is, so this is sort of reimagining public safety, right? So open up our minds, open up the doors, open up the coffers, and, and how would we reimagine this? Uh, right now, there are cities trying radical new things. Um, there are mayor offices trying very new things. We're sort of right now talking of tried and true methods, small grants, charity activities from the police department, you know. How would you, as someone who's been an innovator in some ways in this, who's been mm -hmm. emotionally affected, how would you reimagine public safety um, and, and, and push that um, in the mayor's office? Well, you know, this is what I'm pushing and what I've been pushing is the only way we are going to be able to do and affect any change that we're serious about is we got to make sure that everybody's at the table. 
and everybody that's at the table, that means all the members in the community that's in some way, shape, form, or fashion has a seat at the table that's being represented. You know, it cannot be just made by us, the hierarchies, uh, making decisions. And so I advocate for that all the time. And, and therefore, so when I sit at the table, I'm sitting at the table for, for the little homie who lost his homeboy last week. I'm sitting at the table for the cousin. I'm sitting at the table for the mother who lost the son. And so therefore, that to me is reimagining and bringing someone from a very unorthodox type of uh, place who haven't been in government, who don't do anything but try and love on his people. Are you heard? I think I am. I, I really do. I think I am. And here's the thing about being heard. Time is the only thing that will tell how much I've been heard. I think that's the only way we'll be able to measure uh, really, truly what this is. As I was saying, I went and sat with those guys in L.A., and they was telling me it's been 10 years to get to where they're at, and they still got a lot of a long way to go. So if it takes 10 years, I've been doing this for 30-some years, and so therefore I've still seen you know, death and destruction, but it hadn't stopped me. So, but I think time will be where we'll be able to measure what it is. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, can I just let Commissioner Mann, and um, I appreciate the commissioner's uh, interaction, and we're trying to stick to this thing and get it done by six. Um, and I just think the questions and the comments have so much to do with the interest that the community really has that uh, I really hope you, Mr. Johnson, who came from the outside, that's now a government person, yes. that that's who you are now. Uh, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Mann. The organizations that received the grants, what metrics are you looking for them to improve to see that they were effective? So a couple of things. We, we want them to uh, take advantage of some of the opportunities that CNM is going to provide because some of these smaller organizations have not had the greatest relationship with CNM. I mean, let's just be frank, they have not. Uh, and we want, you know, what I've been doing is trying to bridge that gap and bringing some of those organizations together. Uh, and then two, some of those organizations didn't get along with one another who have come to the table. You know, like, you know, Nashville Peacemakers and, you know, some of the organization, you know, but they are now agreeing to get along for change because we all agree in one sense that we want to stop and change our communities, our communities. And they have agreed to do just that. And so they are going to get, you know, a number of different, you know, like I teach CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. I think that is paramount for that or those organizations to have at least one or two of their members to become a certified CBT specialist. Because to me, that is where we're going to start the processes of what change look like. It's changing the way our young people think. That will change their behavior. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Burton. <laughs> Turn your microphone on, please. Uh. One of the ways to evaluate the priority for the mayor's office is to look at the budget. What is your annual budget? For? For, for uh, CSP? Uh, for grant program? making, yes. Oh, so our annual budget is uh, $1.7 million. Mm -hmm. And how much of that is given to grants? That That's the $1.7 million it's that just would be all grants? given to grants. How yes. many staff people do you have? Just myself, uh, John Bunton, and uh, Dia Sunir. Uh, so three? Yes. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Next up, we will have um, the Community Oversight Board. Executive Director Fritchard. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you all for having me here. It's a very important discussion today. So I know we're talking about reimagining 
police safety. Um, and you sent some questions over. So I'm gonna deal with the questions first and then I'll talk a little bit more about um, where we are with the Community Oversight Board. So one of the things that you asked is what has been the experience with community engagement efforts conducted by MMPD? So most of you know that our community engagement is usually from community members who have suffered some type of um, encounter with the police department that was, in a, was negative. And what I found that's happening with that is when the community members come to us to talk about the issues that they have, most of the time what I found is being the fundamental issue is they haven't been heard. That they have sometimes called over to the police department. Um, they haven't gotten a response. And I think that what's really important is that what they need at that time that they need is empathy. And that empathy is sometimes missing in those conversations. And so I appreciate them calling us and using our services because if they didn't, then we wouldn't hear from them. We wouldn't know what was happening. And so I think that the Community Oversight Board has this opportunity to really change how accountability in this city happens. Um, when we talk about reimagining policing, you can't do that without having independence in accountability. Um, it's something that I think every police department across this country needs. Um, what we found has been really a struggle, though, if we want to just talk about it real frankly, is having the support that we need from our administration and, and sometimes within the police department. I think that there's been some assistance as we have, you know, begin to work on the things that are important, like our MOU and the agreements, but still there's a lack of transparency. And so what I'll say to you is, yeah, we heard a lot of stuff today. We heard from the police department. We also heard from the mayor's office. But at the end of the day, you can say all the stuff that you want to say, but if you don't bring it to the table and you're not here being real, real with us, and then what is that to the community? The community is expecting what I would call procedural justice, right? They want justice when they call us. They want answers. They want us to be responsive. And without the support of the mayor's office, without the support of the police department, and, and even with the community, this will not work, right? This effort that we have spent so much time, at least two years, I know I've worked really hard in the last two years, trying to make this process work, right? We have went through two, well, two chiefs and really two mayors. And it has been a challenge because change means that you have to, you have to you, it means that you have to sacrifice some things. It means that you have to change the way you think about this process and you have to embrace it and that comes from the top. That if, if you don't, if, if you as the people who are in charge don't hold the others accountable, then this work won't get done. I know that firsthand. And so what I'll say is, you know, this is about people's lives, how they're policed in their communities. Some who, and, and I haven't even talked about the survivors of those who have lost loved ones because they call me too. And when they call me, they're expecting some help from us with very limited, we have very limited resources in that way. And so I hope that as I talk about that today, I talk about when those calls come, that those people who are left with loved ones who have been injured, whether it's police brutality, police violence, or just you know encounters that don't um, give them the responses that they need, what do we do as a community? What do we do as a city? We have to address that because we haven't made them whole, and they're left with a whole. So there, there's a, we have a, a group of survivors that, who are also victims. And what we do is we forget about them. They, and, and you know what their number one, their number one issue is? They haven't heard from anyone. They haven't heard from the mayor's office. They haven't heard from the DA's office. They haven't heard from anyone, but they've heard from us. And as I walk through and try to help them, I have very little, little support to do that. And so that leaves me feeling not, I feel like I'm not doing enough. And we all have a responsibility here today to address those who have holes, 
How do we make them whole? And so, you know, I know that I heard a lot about mobility, diversity, but we have to get to back to the training, right? They can go to all of that, but if they're not taught procedural justice and what that looks like while they're in the training academy, and then they're partnered with field training officers who understand procedural justice, because that's where you learn. I was an ex I'm an ex-police officer, and you know, you learn what you learn in the academy. That's your foundational stuff. But it's once you get on the street that you learn the culture, right? You learn that through your field training officers. Who are the are they being vetted? Do we know? Because that's where those issues uh, and biases and all that are, are really exasperated. And so, I mean, there's so many issues today. I heard, we heard from, you know, um, the police department of all the great things that they're doing. And I think that they're doing some things good, absolutely. But I do think that there is some things that need improvement. I also heard from the mayor's office and talked about grants and programs. But where are they when we need them? When they come, I haven't seen them. They're not responding to the things that the, that the community need from the, our perspective. And so, yeah, the Community Oversight Board has challenges. I think that we could have one of the best community oversight boards in this country if we had the support, not only from the mayor's office, the police department, but also from the community. We need you all to support this effort because without this, where do people go? They go back to OPA. Will they get their, I can't say whether or not they will get their problems resolved there, but I'm appreciative that they have confidence in the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. Uh, just two questions and then I'm gonna open it up. And they're all one and the same. What additional resources and or policies would make the COB more effective? Yeah, um, I think resources is we need more investigators. We have people calling. Um, our, in, our numbers are increasing. Once I, I really believe it's because people know about us. The more they know about us, the more they utilize our services. So we need more funding, right? We'll need more funding for that. We'll need you know, additional resources in regards to research. Um, I think that we even need to have a social worker on board. We have people call that have mental health um, you know, concerns. They also call with depression and anxiety from their encounters. I think that we need to have a licensed clinical, clinical social worker on our staff to address those needs. And then we need to make certain that we are partnering with the right people to be able to connect people um, that have, you know, issues um, with, um, well, encounters that, you know, give them trauma or trigger trauma in them. So, yeah, I think that we need additional resources. And I think of, when I think about additional resources, I think that, you know, how the district attorney's office and the public defender's office work, like there's a portion of their budget that goes to, uh, once they, from the DA's office to the public defender's office, if they hire 10, they've got to give, they've got to get three positions over to the public defender's office or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But I, I think that we should have a portion of the police budget to be able to give us the investigators um, and those social workers that they need. They have them over there, and but we don't have them. And I think that if we're talking about mirroring certain types of um, responsibilities and duties, then I think that that's where we could get some of that funding. Okay, and are there any additional policies Yes, absolutely. That would be helpful in your effectiveness. Yeah, our um, research team has done a fantastic job at looking at the trends and practices across the country to find out where we're lacking and using that as a you know to compare where we are lacking. And so right now we have a policy advisory report that's out, um, and we're requesting that they would track soft hand. Um, it's called soft empty hand. Um, and what that is, is when an officer puts his hands on a person um, as they're arresting and they call it resisting, then we just need to know that. It needs to be documented. It's, you know, I think that that's what transparency looks like. You document it. It's there for our, we're able to review it. I think the city, it helps the city. It would save money on, you know, claims. But it also would help people feel like 
if they come in or they make complaints or there's something like that that comes up, that they are able to say, yeah, that happened to me. We know that the body-worn camera footage is going to record some of it, but what if the body-worn camera footage isn't turned on or their cams aren't turned on? And so, yeah, that's a policy that we have out now that we want the support of the community and our board. Um, and we hope that it would be something that the police department could implement really quickly so that we can start tracking that the first part of the year. All right, thank you. Questions from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Abbott. I can't resist. Thank you so much for your discussion. It was really helpful uh, to hear from your perspective. Um, when I think about the COB and the challenges you've, you've had over two, three years, um, and also congratulations on the moves that you've made. I mean, th there is progress. It sounds painstakingly, but progress. So, Thank you. And it's, it's nice to hear that the community does trust somebody, a body, an institution to call. So um, maybe not the most appropriate for some of these issues that you're bringing up, but at least um, you're getting the calls. Um, what, what it seems like to me is that uh, the community wanted something and voted for it but the powers that be were not ready, are not ready, and, and don't want this thing. Is that an accurate sort of description of, of the tension? And uh, you've said the only way really for this to actually work is getting the, the, um, the investment and the support of the mayor's office and the collaboration and cooperation with the police department. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, have you seen a change at all in any of that? Yeah, I think that so it's it's you know it, it comes in waves, right? I think that when we address certain issues, you know, we we sometimes get the kind of response that I, I, it could be watered down. Um, I do think that there has been some change with the new chief in place. I think that having a liaison, um, you know, is important. But I also think that we need to hear from, you know, from the chief as well. I mean, you know, he, he has a responsibility to the community as well. Um, so having a liaison is great. That's the same thing with the police department and the mayor's office. But we have... <laughs> We have a chief of police. We have a mayor that has never came in front of our board. Um, the chief of police has one time and, of course, you know, has always been responsive. But I do think that people want to see them and hear from them. And so, yeah, I would say that most times when you make the calls, it, you do get some response. It may not necessarily be the response that we're looking for or hoping for. Good to see you today. Thank you very much for being here. So you mentioned a couple of things. I understand you, you would like more money, mm -hmm. and uh, I understand yes. that you'd like the police department to adopt soft hands policy. Yes. Uh, beside those two things, if, if, I were, if I were the mayor, what would you like me to do tomorrow? And if I were police chief Drake, what would you like me to do tomorrow? Well, if you were the mayor, I would think that I would like to get a call and set up a meeting um, and meet with me and some of my, the board members. Um, and talk about where we are and how we're and where we're going, um, and and also say yes, you know, to us that we support this effort. And what do we need to do to get the things done? That would be the first thing that I would, you know I would like from the mayor. Um, from the chief, I would like for the chief. You know, we've had this conversation just in our recent board member. Uh, I'm sorry, board meeting, where we asked the chief to have certain people from his department to come and talk about things um, that the board had uh, uh, wanted to address. And they basically was said that the, the liaison would handle that. And I and I've uh, you know I just don't agree with that. I mean, you have a big police department with lots of commanders, lots of people who handle different departments. Someone could come in and answer the questions for the Community Oversight Board. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Salazar. Um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for, for your work. When a member of the community is uh, victimized by uh, uh, members of the police department, what sort of uh, actual power do you have to hold uh, those officers accountable? And um, is that enough? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we do is we make, 
we have what you call a proposed resolution report, which is a process where we present um, those types of um, the response to a, an investigative response to a, um, a, a community member's complaint. And then it goes through the process. And once you go through that process, you know, we look at their discipline grid and we apply discipline based on, you know, a particular procedure. And then it goes to the chief of police for his recommendation. And we've sent over seven actually in the last, you know, month. And so we can make a recommendation, but at the end of the day, it's up to the chief to accept that recommendation. Um, and, you know, so we haven't heard back yet. But no, I don't think that's enough. I think that we should be able to, you know, I think that once we decide what the discipline is and the board makes the decision, I think that should be the discipline. And so I think that we're doing this process with lots of integrity. We have a great investigative staff who are doing the investigations. We have an excellent attorney on staff who's reviewing them. And I think that we have the ability to do that. So no, it's not enough. Yeah. Thank you so much, Commissioner Fitchard. And again, thank you for the work that you do with the CLB. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, next we'd like to hear from the NAACP. All right, good evening. I'm attorney Joy Kimbrough, and I am here on behalf of the Legal Red Redress Committee of the NAACP, where we serve under Attorney Courtney Teasley and the President, Attorney Cheryl Gwynn. This is Attorney Derek Scretchen. Um, I will speak this evening regarding um, a specific instance of um, severe misconduct on behalf of the police department, uh, which is indicative of a more widespread problem. At the beginning of 2021, we had on the police department two paid Metro Nashville Police Department employees indicted on first degree murder, another one indicted on second degree murder. I will speak about Officer Nathan Glass, who now still sits on the police department receiving a check as he has been indicted on second degree murder. In October around 28, well, I'm sorry, it was, I believe it's October 2018. Nathan Glass, then a security guard, was working at uh, the Pharmacy Burger over in East Nashville on McFerrin Avenue. Uh, he was a security guard there. A young man by the name of D'Angelo Knox was running from three gunmen. As he was running, he ran, he ran past the um, Pharmacy Burger. Nathan Glass opened the door of the Pharmacy Burger stood in the doorway, put his gun outside, one shot, pop, and shot D'Angelo Knox in the back of the head as he ran past from three gunmen. He fell dead. He died there on the scene. Um, Metro Nashville police investigated that shooting. They investigated that shooting. They questioned him extensively, and something rare happened here. He answered questions with no attorney. So they were able to hear everything that happened. They were able to know, uh, they knew about his inconsistent statements. At some point later on, it just so happened Pharmacy Burger had a video and they were able to compare his statements with the video. After they investigated Metro Nashville police detectives, they took the case to the district attorney's office and spoke with um, Assistant District Attorney Pamela Anderson who has since been fired. But she investigated the case on behalf of her department and determined that th this was self-defense. It was self-defense. And there were no charges brought at that time. Later on, a um, couple of months later, Metro Police 
hired him as a police officer after he had shot this man dead. This same man, Officer Nathan Glass, had a lot of information out over the internet, social media, regarding uh, some, of his, some of his racist beliefs. They were racist posts. His name on social media, which should have been um, immediately detected. Okay. His name on social media was Nathan Glass underscore 88. And that 88 uh, is commonly associated with Hail Hitler. The, uh, the two, I see the two uh, letters of the alphabet, H and H, Hail Hitler. But anyway, he's, and I'm, I need to rest so he can go, but he still sits on the police department today. There has been no accountability, no transparency about anything that has uh, occurred or any discipline on behalf of the police department as it relates to that specific case. And, and now I'll go uh, turn it over to Attorney Derek Scratchin. I'll try to be brief, Derek Scratchin. I've been a criminal defense lawyer, a criminal lawyer in this city for almost 25 years, seven years as a prosecutor, the remaining years as a defense attorney. So it's on now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So the question is reimagining public safety, and we've heard from police officers, we've heard the commissioner's comments. I took note, when the police officer was talking, he talked about giving out backpacks, giving out diapers, giving out candy and new bikes, creating partnerships. And in the same paragraph, he talked about the decades of trauma that people have had to suffer and officers having to respond to that trauma. One of the commissioners made the uh, point, well, hold on, I think you guys have a confusion of strategy. And what I want to say is that that confusion is intentional. They want you to focus on the superficial and the cosmetic. What we're talking about, if there's any change that's to be made to the police office, it's going to have to be structural, institutional, and cultural. Changes at the core. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about and how it relates to Nashville. Just in terms of, Ms. Kimbrough talked about their hiring, the way that they hire, the way that they don't screen out. That has nothing to do with handing out candy. I want to talk about the way that they disseminate information, the way that they discuss cases. For instance, um, Nika Holbert shot Officer Josh Baker. It was all over the news, March the 12th. 12 hours later, the police department had gone through and cherry-picked clips from the, the camera, and what they did is had Don Aaron to do a voiceover, and they made this compelling propaganda piece, and they called it um, a video news release to get out their side of the story, okay? Fast forward ahead, there was another case this year. You know, there was a slate of police shootings here in Nashville, so it's probably hard for you to distinguish which ones I'm talking about. But this one involved a Jacob Griffin, who was a mentally ill man. And once again, they did the same thing. This time, um, Chief Drake came and gave a short statement about, well, I believe that, um, that Mr. Griffin fired at the officers um, two times. Once again, they took parts of the clips, and he did a voiceover. Don Aaron did a voiceover. They called this a critical incident briefing. Now, the Tennessean was not satisfied with this. What they said is we will, they tried to get a subpoena for the entire clip, and it was denied. They would not release it. So what we're talking about is something institutional. When they release full videos and when they don't. It seems that they release full videos when it's an advantage, and they do it under the guise of full disclosure. We want to inform the community. What they're doing is they're trying to sway the public opinion and they're trying to control the narrative but when they don't release it this is what you can know is that it was harmful to them they don't release the video when it's bad for them then they cite well it's an ongoing investigation so that's a structural um, something that's within your purview so if we're going to talk about change and engendering trust with the community We've got to get at the core of what they stand for. Handing out candy, handing out backpacks is not going to get it. I could go on all day. There's so many structural um, just deficiencies in that police department. And they have, like he said, decades of trauma. They have been distorting the media for years with half-truths and just complete lies. And they've done this to the detriment of the black and brown community. And I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, um, 
Mr. Scretchen and Ms. Kimbrough. Questions from the commissioners? Go ahead. What was the, I know that you filed a complaint um, as, about the Nathan Glass situation. What was the response of the mayor's office and the police office? What was the response? We never got a response from the police department nor the mayor's office. He was eventually indicted, uh, and I don't believe that was through any part on the police department. But he was eventually uh, indicted, and like I said, the prosecutor who initially said, oh, this was self-defense, and gave some reasons why, uh, without releasing a video or anything, she was eventually fired. Um, but nothing, and that's the transparency I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if those same officers who did the background check are still there. I don't know if that's something prevalent within their office, where when you're white and applying for a job, you get this, um, okay, wink, wink, nod, nod. You know, I know it hasn't been that way for, I've heard these stories, and um, I too have been a police officer, but I've heard stories where it's hard for African Americans, I know it's hard for African Americans to be hired as police officers. And um, so, but it, it seems like really, literally, you can get away with murder if you're white and apply. Commissioner Everfaz. I'll be really brief. Uh, you went, you talked about some structural, I mean, the problem is structural. And you talked about one issue, which was uh, media and control and the message. Because you've been so, um, you know, in this for so long, I was just wondering, could you tell me what are the three things structurally, you, you mentioned the message, the media, the communications, that you would want to change immediately today? Just you know. The most important thing would be the use of force guidelines. What they are allowed to do when they interact with civilians and what they're not allowed to do and how those numbers are tabulated and then how those numbers are communicated to the public. Because if the public doesn't know the true nature of the police brutality, we know about the spectacular killings that are on the news. But they have, I, th I thought the community board was going to mention something. Right now they are, um, which I thought real interesting, it's called uh, soft, um, soft empty hand control. Soft empty hand control. A euphemism for if we beat you up and we don't kill you, we don't use a weapon, we don't have to write a report for it. And those are the things that speak to the public safety that our constituents are concerned with. So that's number one. I would like a prohibition on that. And if um, not only a prohibition, but going hand in hand with that, I'd like to see strict record keeping, keeping for any time a police officer has to put his hands on any citizen. Um, that would be number one. Number two would be what I refer to. I hate that the public has given the police such um, the worst kept secret in the courthouse is that police lie and they lie regularly. And I tell you what, this is not just the rantings of a criminal defense lawyer. All you have to do is go look back in some of these very um, famous cases like George Floyd, Take a look at what you know about the case and then go back and look at the original police supplement and what they said originally about it. His original well um, subject died from a medical condition during a police encounter. You saw what happened in the trial. That's just the spectacular. That happens on a regular basis. So I wish that the public was aware of how those deceptions affect them so that we could come up with something that, hey, you don't have the good faith and the good will. We just believe anything that you say. Um, and in terms of, I would go, probably the third thing is the hiring. Who are they going to hire? Because I've known black applicants to get um, turned away simply because they had a simple possession of marijuana in the past. But here's this person that was described who had a video, a social media history that indicated um, anti-black feelings. Nothing was done about that. It seems like if you're, um, they hire people who they understand or sympathize with. 
So I hope those three areas. I got plenty more, but <laughs> I'll stop there. Are there any other questions from the commission? Thank you so much. I have a whole bunch, and I'm just going to let them all just wait and sit by. But thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we want to hear from the community oversight now. No, I am not Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin was supposed to be here today, but he asked me to sit here for him. So my name is Theda Murphy, and um, I am the grassroots coordinator at No Exceptions Prison Collective. You can go to the next slide. A little bit about me. I have worked as a crisis counselor for about 17 years. I worked for MMPD and victim intervention. I worked uh, mobile crisis for volunteer behavioral health. And I worked at Crisis Care Commission for Centerstone, which involved answering um, the crisis line and dispatching mobile crisis clinicians. So I was also one of the core organizers with Community Oversight Now. You can go to the next slide. So um, the current push for police accountability started on February 10th, 2017, when Jacqueline Clemens was murdered by Officer Joshua Lippert. The subsequent protests um, culminated in shutting down the city council, which happened because the council members were not listening to the community. And um, people are continuing to die, and people in power are continuing not to listen. Uh, city council was shut down again earlier this year uh, during the budget vote because they were not listening to the will of the people. Um, calls for accountability are not going to stop just because they're falling on deaf ears. They're going to continue because there's just too much at stake. So today, I wanted to talk about the ultimate reimagining of public safety, which is abolition. Uh, go, you can go to the next slide. So ab what is abolition? Abolition is a political vision a politi political division of a society that addresses harm, not by punishment and violence, but by um, equity and compassion. Um, some of the things that abolition is not, it's not anarchy, anarchy, it's not a lack of social control, it's not reactionary, it's uh, principled and thoughtful. Uh, it's also not utopianism. We know that people commit harm. We know people get into conflict. We know people violate the social contract. We are simply envisioning a society where those infractions are not met by violence and, and uh, cruelty. You can go to the next slide. So the basic principles of abolition are uh, based on three pillars. A moratorium, stop building new jails and cages, uh, decarceration, release people who are currently in jails and in cages, and decriminalize, uh, stop criminalizing behavior, stop creating new categories of, of um, criminals. And then finally, excarceration, which is the visionary part of abolition. It's based on transformative justice. So um, we know that there's a challenge in doing these. We know that um, cities may decide that instead of policing, they want uh, to privatize it. Or, as we are seeing, even in here in Nashville, police departments can create, will create private sources of funding which are completely outside of the purview of public scrutiny. We don't know where the money's going, coming from. We don't know where it's going. And we know that uh, um, MMPD is doing that even right now. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So abolition is not a new idea. 
It's been around at least since the Kerner Commission in 1967. Um, in 1976, the, the pillars were, were instituted. And then um, finally in 97, a group called Crit Critical Resistance came together and really started pushing toward decarceration and re reimagining um, the criminal punishment system. So the last thing I want to talk about in, in, in light of um, abolition, next slide, is to talk about disability justice. So disability justice recognizes the inherently punitive and carceral nature of current responses to mental health care um, that, are, that we use routinely. And the idea is to implement solutions which are created by the people who are most impacted by um, mental health, the mental health system and create pro programs that are directly accountable to those, to those people and to the community. And it's seeking to dismantle the nonprofit industrial complex, complex which is a thing. And that's when nonprofit com community service providers become more beholden to their funders and get totally disconnected from the needs of the people that they are supposed to serve. So uh, you can skip to the, to the next slide. And we have an urgency about this because people are dying. People are dying and, and people who have mental health crisis are more likely to be killed and incarcerated. There have been two uh, shootings this year involving people, one was just mentioned, that, inter that, in, that happened in a death. The police are traumatizing people. The police are the source of the trauma. So briefly about the budget, that's the next slide. Uh, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. Um, uh, you can go to the next one. The uh, police, to, the people have said in surveys that we have done, that we, we surveyed the community in 2020 and 2021, one of the findings that happened across both surveys is that people wanted de decreased funding to the police department. They wanted that funding redirected toward community resources, such as mental health, such as uh, education, such as housing. Um, and one of the things that they really wanted was a non-police crisis inter intervention response. So um, I'm running out of time. So one of the things that we are doing now is that we have a uh, bunch of people in the community who are getting together the Nashville Community Crisis Response. This is people in the community who are working together to come up with a totally community-based crisis response that does not involve police, that is not a code response, that is truly accountable to the people in the community. So finally, the last thing I want to do is that talk about three questions that we need to ask ourselves right now. So why does every service that the community requests have to be provided through the police or courts? We need to ask ourselves, are we really listening to the people who are directly impacted by policing? And we need to ask, is it wise to continue to funnel scarce public resources into systems of punishment at the expense <coughs> of systems of care? I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Questions from the commission? Yes, Dr. Richard. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, MNPD is getting private funding, could you elaborate a little bit more on, on what, uh, what they're, they're getting? Thank you. There is a, a private fund that is being set up by private individuals to provide funding to MNPD for services now. Because this is completely private, we have no idea who these people are or what that money will be used for. It is completely outside of public scrutiny. So there would be no public accountability? There would be case? no public accountability. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Charles. Uh Thank you for all your work, Ms. Murphy. I, I have a, a question. And it is uh, why abolition in, instead of, of reform? I, I think the, the more mainstream uh, uh, ideas reform and and why uh, why why abolition instead? Well, 
We have tried to reform the police department. We talked about two reforms tonight that are really in trouble. One is the community oversight board, completely starved of resources and unable to do its job. The other one is the, the body cameras. Uh, as the attorney just, just mentioned, um, we can't get, we're not getting the accountability that we wanted from those body camera programs. So, every, so reform has been tried. It's been tried and tried and tried and tried. So at what point do we say reform is not gonna work? This institution is fundamentally flawed and we need to scrap it and do something else. Go ahead, Commissioner Vanning. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I wasn't able to look at the pie chart of people's budget. Right. I've, I've seen I can, it before. I've seen I it can before. give copies of I, it. No, I've seen it here. before. Uh, could you describe for us what traditional policing functions would remain in an institution uh, under the alternative policing budget, people's, people's budget coalition? Budget. Well, the idea of abolition is that when you have a community that is, where everyone in the community is completely re resourced, mm -hmm. you don't need a police department. So what you would have is you would have ways of addressing conflict, um, ways of addressing um, harm when people do do things that are harmful, that are based in the community, that don't rely on violence. Um, I can't think of anywhere where, where people have really had this serious conversation. This is not something that exists anywhere because we, we, just ha we haven't had a conversation about abolition. We, have, we don't talk truthfully about the police department. You asked earlier about the trauma. We can't even talk openly about the fact that the police is a source of trauma. So abolition is a conversation that we need to start having, and then we can start thinking about the, what those alternative institutions would be. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Mayor. For the People's Budget Survey, how many people responded to that? This year, it was about 2,000, right? How many? 3,500. 3,500. Right, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? I just read... Thank you for being here, by the way. This is really helpful. Uh, I just read an article by the conservative-leaning um, newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, yes. about all the um, departments that have refunded after defunding yes. last year. I just wanted to hear your response to that. Um, I understand that in the abolition model, it's all defunded. It all goes away, not partially, not, you know. Right. So this could have been a half-baked you know, approach, right. uh, but I'd love to hear. Which is why I'm not talking about defund. Right. I'm talking about abolition. Um, well, the MMPD has not been defunded yet. If anything, they, they've gotten, they've gotten increases. So we haven't even tried that yet. <laughs> I think they've used that as Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, my last comment, thank you for coming, but I think it is clear uh, sociologists uh, and others uh, have completed longitudinal studies that challenge us to look at public safety beyond police and fire. And right now that's what we have is we don't figure in health care, poverty, uh, homelessness, and affordable housing as all contributors to how we handle issues. Right now, you take a poor person with a mental health issue, we police the problem. Um, I think uh, our city has several cases that where we've shown that um, when the police department refused to, um, in, when the police department refused to enforce the mask mandate on the visitors downtown, the chief went on record, a different chief at that time, who said he was not going to do that. When pressured to do that, they arrested a homeless black man and put him in jail with a $5,000 bond. That was their response. So uh, uh, again, I thank you, uh, 
Ms. Murphy and all of you up to this point as we continue, that we just want to give uh, more amplification to this issue that for the betterment of Nashville, the it city, we have to look at public safety beyond police and fire. And um, if you take care of the housing, if you take care of these needs, as these studies would suggest, then it would also suggest that there be a correlation between how much money the police department would actually need. So thank you again for sharing. And thank you all for letting me get that off my chest as uh, chairperson. Commissioner Tucker. Yes. Since we have extra time, I'd like to introduce a motion uh, to have a uh, public comment. If, if we have a few minutes, would that be OK? Well, uh, yes, we have two more. We have uh, Park Center and Safer Schools. And if there is time remaining, and if those would like, I will stay uh, after 6, if necessary. Thank you. Appreciate for it. that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Park Center. I thought I was going to get off the hook there. I thought we were in and early. Hey, can you hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whew. All right. My name is Will Conley, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I am the CEO of Park Center. Park Center is a nonprofit mental health organization that uh, just, you know, following up on your comments there, we are one of the largest or the largest housing provider for people who, are, who have a diagnosis of a mental illness. We also have a large street outreach team that works um, every day on the streets of Nashville to engage people experiencing homelessness and to help them um, get into housing or get whatever that they're looking for. So um, we uh, have been around since the 80s. We also... Um, provide uh, employment services to people who are looking for a job, even though they may have been out of the workforce for a long time. Um, and we try to listen to folks that we work with to, to hear what they, what they want. So um, usually what we hear is they want a home, a job, and a date on the weekend, which uh, to us means deeply affordable housing, a job even if they're on a disability check maybe, and just human connection. Um, people are just thirsty for that. So uh, I, um, just a little bit about me. I um, grew up in this city. Uh, my first job, my first real job was doing street outreach in downtown Nashville, engaging people experiencing homelessness. And that's how I learned about the homelessness system um, after growing up in Belmede and a lily white neighborhood. Um, I've seen, I've worked deeply with uh, police departments on uh, working on homelessness. I've actually run, uh, uh, actually used to run the, the Metro Homelessness Commission, and we used to have board meetings in this room, which is a little, uh, I have some like weird deja vu going on right now. Um, and uh, Chief Drake was on my board at that time. So, um, and there are other commanders and officers who we've collaborated with deeply who have been effective and um, in, in helping us respond to the need uh, uh, around homelessness and housing and mental health. Um, I've also seen um, trauma on the streets. I've seen victimization and violence. Uh, I've seen death. Uh, homelessness is, um, is deadly, it's fatal, and um, and, and the answer to homelessness is housing. And so uh, I think, you know, um, well, I'll, maybe I'll come back to that. But I think to respond more effectively, um, we need to have a committed leadership in the city who um, is committed to improving mental health conditions for people uh, who are living outside or who are on, um, at risk of uh, homelessness. Uh, so a single entity that's, that's committed to ending homelessness and also to improving mental health. I can't think of the entity in Nashville that's responsible for improving mental health outcomes uh, for Nashvilleians. So a committed leadership, uh, clear policies to respond to people in crisis. Uh, I think um, obviously we need more resources resources that aren't just like pills and forced treatment. Um, we need to get more creative. And I think 
we have more responses now than we used to. We have like the mental health co-op uh, and the police have joined up to provide like the, the, uh, the crisis alternatives and the outreach and that's great, but I think we can also get more creative and talk about other, other responses that may or may not involve clinicians and, and people that have um, firearms. I uh, also think we need a formal process for reviewing our performance um, around all these issues and measuring our efforts against outcomes that we agree on, like um, outcomes like increased connections to resources, reduced encounters with the police, uh, let's see, minim minimizing arrests, um, and of course, you know, more, more housing for people that need it. Um, and yeah, I think like, you know, we're talking about reimagining things. Um, I mentioned accountability. Um, I think it's also helpful to have people who have lived experience of recovery and mental illness who can respond to people who are in crisis. Um, uh, that's something that Park Center is kind of uh, investing in these days. Um, also just non-clinical resources. Uh, we have, our system does some good things. It can also be very dehumanizing um, and a scary place to go to, obviously. So uh, I'm talking about the mental health system. Um, and so instead of like, if someone's in crisis, instead of like separating them from their families uh, and their jobs and like putting them in a place that's very sterile and hospital-like, I think we can offer more home-like settings that are staffed with peers with lived experience. Um, let's see. I think that's about it. I would love to um, answer any questions you have, but just like happy to be here and happy to save a little bit time, a little bit of time for you all. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions? Are you involved in any training with the police department with regard to working uh, with people with mental illness? Are you engaged at all? Not currently, no. No. Do you know who does that kind of training? Are you involved or related to any organization that does that kind of training with them? I assume uh, the Mental Health Cooperative does that with the police department through... The Mental Health Co-op does it? Yeah. And we, we're partners with them, um, but I, I assume that's happening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Commissioner Vanning. Thank you very much for being here. So what, uh, what kind of resources would be required to address the, the homelessness issue that you identified and are familiar with? Yeah, I think, um, well, first we need landlords who are willing to take uh, housing choice vouchers or what we often think of as, or what we often call Section 8 vouchers. So. We have people that have vouchers in their hands but don't have anywhere to, to use them. Um, and we have a lot of financial incentives right now for landlords to help them uh, get more comfortable in taking that voucher, like thousands of dollars and basically like signing bonuses for landlords. So um, that would be helpful in terms of just accessing um, units that already exist. Then, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, action around affordable housing, but it's often, and that's great, but it's often for people that have higher incomes, like around 80% or so of AMI. And I think, you know, we work with people who are at zero to 30% of area median, area median income, or maybe 50%. Um, and there aren't too many developers, uh, I can't really think of any, actually, that are like focusing on trying to make it, trying to build housing for people who have extremely low incomes like zero to 30, and have high barriers to housing. Uh, you know, justice involvement, um, active addictions, um, uh, poor housing histories. And so, um, you know, and that to me is a lack of leadership. And so developing leadership uh, expertise around housing development, which is a tricky thing to get into. Uh, it's a complicated business to make the numbers work and to make it feasible financially and also just to put these deals together. So that's something that Park Center is um, very interested in doing. And, and as I mentioned, we are uh, a large uh, housing provider and want to continue to be. So I think more capital for that we can layer on 
to these to like the Barnes Fund and other other funds that are out there, or just more funds, more money for the Barnes Fund and prioritizing projects that are zero to thirty percent AMI. Um, Lastly, I'll just say uh, we need more funding for support services for people who are in housing. So we have teams that uh, help people uh, stay in their apartments, uh, maintain their lease agreements. Um, and we do that by coming by um, regularly, uh, you know, not, not as a surprise or anything, but just as a partner with the person who's trying to maintain their lease. So those teams are um, costly. Uh, they're, you know, we want to be 24-7 because, you know, sometimes people need us at, at odd hours. And so, um, yeah, more capital, money for um, supportive services, and then um, just leadership around, the, around extremely low income, affordable housing. Uh, and follow up. Uh, so is that leadership currently being expressed through the mayor's office? <clears throat> Um, I don't know how to answer that. I think um, the Barnes Fund uh, currently has the, I think it's the most money in it that I've ever seen. Um, so, at least in the Barnes Fund. Um, but, uh, and I think you may get more points in that process if you are focusing on zero to 30%. So, um, that's that's helpful. Okay, the other thing you mentioned was a, 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 a uh, uh, focal point on dealing with mental health issues mm -hmm. uh, and what would need what needs to be done from the city's point of view in that regard I know I know for years uh, there was a community mental health center at Meharry I know that um, at, at Hubbard Hospital I know that Meharry has been known for its psychiatric program but I mean what 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 could what needs to be done in the city to focus attention on the mental health needs uh, of the population you're dealing with yeah, I think, um, you know, it would be great if we could expand Medicaid, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, that'd be nice. And then, um, you know, I I think, like, I go back to leadership. I think we could do a lot if we had the political will um, and we had a body, an entity, that was being held accountable for improving uh, mental health outcomes for our neighbors. Um, and that was looking at an array of uh, responses. So I think in our country, we we often turn to the, to the easy fix uh, in the mental health system. It's medication. Um, which can work, uh, it, can, it can help, um, but it doesn't um, offer connection uh, with other people, um, and, uh, and often, it doesn't, often it doesn't work, um, and then you're labeled non-compliant, um, even though you have very good reasons why you're not taking it. So I think, um, you know, making sure that having an entity that's responsible for making sure the clinical services are available, but also getting uh, outside of that medical model and offering non-clinical just relationships and responses that are trauma-informed and empathetic um, that can help people uh, have hope um, that things are going to get better. Yep. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Safer Schools, Nashville. And my colleague Marcus is in to turn the Q&A. Yeah. Um, greetings, Chair Tucker, Director Fowler, Green, and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for inviting us to speak at this hearing. Uh, my name is Kosad Kosad, and I'm a member of Safer Schools Nashville, a grassroots organization composed of MMPS graduates working towards safer alternatives to school policing and punitive discipline, and are committed to advancing the social, emotional, and intellectual development of all MMPS students. As a graduate of MMPS K-12 schools, I've experienced the good and bad from attending underfunded zone schools to schools that receive more funding than others. 
My motivation to end the school to prison pipeline and advocate for social emotional learning stems in large part from my personal experience with the school to prison pipeline and larger carceral state. I first experienced the effects of the justice system with the incarceration of my younger brother. I bore witness to the all too familiar trajectory of suspensions in schools, starting in elementary school, interactions with school resource officers, and on the receiving end of various punitive disciplinary measures that ultimately snowballed into his incarceration. It's one thing to read about the concept of the school to prison pipeline, but it's another to actually experience it through one's family and see its effects materialize in real time. There are so many days where I contemplate and ask myself, what if he was actually supported in schools uh, instead of policed and disciplined? What if the solution to his behavior wasn't being subjected to weeks long participation at subpar alternative schools? What if he wasn't referred to law enforcement due to an incident at school? What if we moved away from zero tolerance policies and moved towards an emphasis on social emotional learning and underlying causes of behaviors? What if his school had school-based crisis teams and counselors in place to support him, myself, and other students dealing with loss? Would he be incarcerated today if he had these resources and support? I don't believe so. <laughs> now we get to the reason why we're here today. We're here today to discuss community policing. Community policing often calls for increased partnership between the police and community organizations. This model has a lofty goal, and it requires a po that police can be good partners that serve our city and uplift its students. In our schools, there's ample evidence that the par partnership between police and school personnel is harmful to students. For example, in MMPS, 40% of the student population is black, yet black students represent 77% of referrals to law enforcement and 66% of student arrests. Further, 100% of students who were arrested in 2017 and 2018 were students with an identified disability or individualized education plan. This is a dramatic and disturbing disparity. School arrests have been proven to linger with students even if they are not the arrested students, creating tensions and hostilities in an environment that should be nurturing. Furthermore, studies have demonstrated that the very act of being arrested at an early age rather than the student's own social and psychological factors before their arrest significantly derailed the educational trajectories of students. Beyond the psychological damage, early uh, introductions to the criminal justice system followed children throughout their lives. We talked to an MMPS student who had a really bad encounter with an SRO and was wrongfully singled out by them in their school. And here's what they had to say. I think after that moment, I never felt safe, like fully safe again. I became a bit more recluse, but I was still very involved in the school. Anytime the school resource officer was nearby, I didn't want to be in the same space. I wasn't able to look at my school or that environment the same way. I still love my experience and am grateful for the opportunities, but I'll never be able to walk into that building and feel the same way that I did my first year or sophomore year. The SRO damaged the student's learning environment to the point they didn't even feel safe. The recent reporting out of Rutherford County that is focused on the arrest of young black children in schools poignantly captures the damage of a school arrest. Some students who were arrested on trumped up non-existent charges, planned charges, are now afraid to return to school and are working through the trauma of interactions with school police. I encourage you all to read the article about Rutherford County and consider how our children are impacted by police in schools because it is stomach churning. Ultimately, police officers are trained to use specific tools, arrests, citations, guns. But these tools are inappropriate. Rather than referring problem children, to, problem children to the juvenile justice system, behavioral issues can be handled within schools by schools. One key assumption of community policing is that the police are complementary to existing infrastructure. In schools, the necessary infrastructure does not exist. Most MMPS schools lack a full-time nurse and a full-time psychologist. At a school board meeting on September 13th, the director of Metro Schools, Dr. Adrian Battle, updated the school board saying that there are about 34 schools that are still sharing a single nurse. 34 schools, one nurse. Before we put more police in schools, proven supports like nurses and psychologists should be prioritized and available to all students. Many school districts across the country have also had these conversations on school policing and have come to the realization that the presence of SROs, cops, have been damaging to our youth. School districts like Denver, Milwaukee, Oakland, San Jose, Madison, Minnesota, Phoenix, and LA have terminated their contracts with their police departments. What I'm talking about right now has been reimagined and is being implemented. SEL funding is a clear step to interrupt the school to prison pipeline and is supported by both the MMPS administration and the school board. Data shows significant benefits for students that have access to universal SEL. Students are more likely to be academically successful by an average of 13% compared to their peers. Students are less likely to abuse substances, uh, experience high levels of emotional distress, and struggle with conduct problems. When kids receive uh, SEL early in their education, 
they are less likely to end up in prisons and more likely to get a college degree and have a full-time job by the time they are 25. Instead of SELs, our schools have relied on harsh disciplinary measures that have racial biases. For example, three times as many African-American children were suspended as white children in the 2019 and 2020 school year, making up 58% 58, 58 of in-school suspensions, 65% of out-of-school suspensions, and almost 75% of expulsions. Minorities as a whole make up of almost 90% of referrals to law enforcement, and disabled students make up a stunning 97% of referrals to law enforcement and MMPS. We asked the MMPS high school teacher what punitive discipline does to students. Here's what they said. There's two responses from students when there's a punitive way that a situation is handled. One is that they shut down. And I think that's often what we see is they stop participating in class. They don't talk. They don't share their feelings or emotions. They might just get through what they have to get through to get the class done. The opposite is that they act out. This past budget cycle, we had the most investment in our schools. While we are glad that there is increased funding for our schools, this is still not enough to fully fund SEL. The allocated 2.5 million only covers restorative practice assistance in elementary schools, but not middle or high schools. As a community and as a city, we must aim high. Ultimately, for our children to learn and be successful, we must limit time spent outside of the classroom. SCL helps children stay in school and provides a foundation for their future. Any of the school to prison pipeline requires a full funding and implementation of SEL and the removal of costs from MMPS. When I think about my brother, I think of the missed opportunities, the misinterventions, the ways he got caught in the school to prison pipeline before he was even a teenager. The most tragic part of my brother's story is that it's become all too common in our city and schools. There are so many students that have walked the same path. His path into the carceral system began in MMPS schools, and the lack of SEL supports available to him will continue to motivate not me and others to fight for improvements in SEL. This fight brings us to our current moment, our opportunity to right these wrongs. We have a once in a generation opportunity to reimagine the way our schools operate, the ways our communities operate. Schools where students are given the tools to thrive and professionals are trained in restorative and healing practices. Where communities, schools, students, families, teachers and staff are directly invested in. Where our students are given the opportunity to learn more, to learn without armed cops in their presence. Let us seize this moment, let us support our schools and our children. Nash will be better for it. Thank you. Sorry about that, I know I went over time. Questions from the commission? Thank you for being here today. I, what, I was under the impression that in the um, Metro school budget that was just passed, that that provided for school nurse and school counselors in every school. Is that, am I wrong about that? I mean, to my understanding, the aspirational budget had funding that was advocating for that have a fully funded positions in all schools for um, advocacy. I know advocacy centers have this will be full counselors and psychologists supposedly in each elementary school. There's, I think, within that council budget, supposedly funding to have it. So um, there would, like you said, it'd be every nurse in every school. Last I checked, that wasn't final. Um, that's something I obviously can maybe be able to discuss with you afterwards. But to my understanding, that's an aspirational goal and not a final goal. Okay, uh, and uh, who has the decision-making authority about whether or not there are SROs in our, in our schools? So, Nashville is pretty unique in the sense that, um, you know, the MMPS school board, you know, they, they can terminate their contract with, you know, the uh, police department, but the, the police department is, they fund school resource officers. And so in other kind of districts, you see that, M you know, the school districts would provide the you know, money for, you know, SROs, and so it's, you know, a bit more complicated, and so we have to kind of approach this from a two, you know, from two ways. In that we approach the council, and you know, allocate the money that's allocated for you know MNPD, and reallocate that to MMPS. And so we're in this kind of like ping pong situation with you know the MMPS school board and with the Metro Council. In that you know one side saying we'll do it, we just uh, the money's not you know guaranteed. Would it come back to us? Um, and you know Metro Council saying. We're just going to follow, um, you know, MMPS's lead. So it's, I think we're in that situation right now, and we've been having a lot of conversations with school board members, council members, um, as well as other, you know, community members as well. And I think that is a, a response that is inherently based on what I think these people in power in this county and in this district see as being priorities. The police department, we had conversations with the school board, Metro Council, and the police department several times. Even Deputy Chief Floor, we've had meetings with him before about a specific topic. Uh, they've expressed the ability to reimagine public safety, and even even they're uh, they were nagged on the idea, and that is their um, prerogative. Um, but even the idea of removing SROs in general was discussed with the police department. Now, what they want though is that money. 
they want the money for whatever the police department wants to use that money for. So it becomes incumbent on those in power within the district and the city and the council themselves to figure out where that money is going to come from. And if they see it as being a priority to fund what is best for our students and what we, I think, can provide pretty of data, de anecdotes, and background information on logic and reason why it is what is best for our students. Um, so that I, inherently is an issue that we've run up against throughout our lobbying over the last almost two years. Um, the discussion has been had with all of those institutions within the district and city. Um, and it's about what they want to do next. The police department has already said they want that money back. Um, there is state funding that mandates public safety funding from the state, um, but I don't want to complicate you guys' life with the state <laughs> um, right now. You gave a number early on in your presentation that uh, was 100% of something around uh, students with disabilities or something. Yeah. Would you restate that for me? Um, yes. So, uh, so 100 percent of the students who were arrested in 2017 to 2018 were students with an identified disability or individualized education plan, and so it's based under kind of like the classification of um, the uh, federal Department of Education uh, on what you know disability means. Um, and we've we got that statistic from the Office of Civil Rights uh, at the Department of Education. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So that's the way that it would appear to me that that's how we're handling yeah. those children with those needs in our schools is by policing it. Policing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner Burton. I wanted to make sure that we we're going to get. Can we get copies of those uh, statistics with our with the report? We'll get a copy of your report, so we'll have yeah. that number. We'll share that. Yeah, we're we're also uh, in the process of uh, issuing a report pretty soon, um, where we've been kind of analyzing the federal, state, and state data databases, and uh, we're coming out with our findings. And we'll share a lot of that research that we have with the commission. I have one more question. Do you know if there is an age limit for police handling? Uh, children, so actually putting the, their hands on children. So the in, the intriguing aspect of I think Kosar mentioned that the uh, the relationship that we have between the district and the police department is very interesting in um, Davidson County. Um, the police do not report to anyone in the Metro National Public Schools. They report to the police department. Um, there's instances we can have provide anecdotes for of principals who have students who they've had not want to be arrested. They've had students that want to be disciplined in other ways. They've had students they thought were not as big of an issue as the police department have thought who have been arrested, jailed, or taken away. Um, the police officers, SRO specifically, do not report to anyone in the school. They can consult with the principal. Um, that is their prerogative. Mm -hmm. um, but their actual bosses is still the Metro National Police Department, and the students are made by their sergeant lieutenants, yeah. captains, whoever is above them. So I am not, in, and Coaster may be able to answer that question, exactly sure what that use of force really would be. I don't think there's any age limit. Um, we have anecdotes that have gone as low as age seven, age six, um, of students who have been touched um, or had their hands put on uh, by officers. Um, and that is, I think, an interesting, and to quite frankly, in my opinion, sad aspect of that agreement between the district and the police department, but they do not have to listen to a single person in that building besides themselves or their captain if they show up. Yeah. And one of the main reasons why SROs are not in elementary schools right now is because I think in 2017, um, 113 students ages 12 and under were arrested at MPS. Um, and there were some pretty horrific cases. Many of those students, many of those uh, youth were, you know, ha uh, were diagnosed with severe mental health illnesses. And so, you know, and not to say that, you know, uh, we can't just, you know, that um, it's okay for older students because it's not at the end of the day, um, but just, the fact that we had to remove SROs from elementary schools because of that uh, is pretty alarming. And on the, it, on the worst, most unfortunate end, it, it seems to have, um, at least in my view, uh, a pattern being created of the complex needs of students who are especially in dire situations are being handled by police officers as a convenience, not as um, you know what should be happening. Um, there's principals um, who you know, obviously will principal their school how they want to, um, but who our students and teachers have talked about the SROs as almost being like their watchdogs um, who are there to deal with the issues of students who they don't have the time to deal with every week. They don't have the, the nurse, psychologist, counselor, um, advocacy center, um, intervention room, um, be well room, whatever different alternative that already exists in this district, um, which we could talk about if asked about also to use, but instead SROs to intervene in situations that are complex and they just don't have the time or feel the need 
to go into that complex, I guess, uh, action to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, if you could, if you don't mind, if you could submit a copy of your presentation yeah. to us, we would definitely appreciate that. And we have a, a research sheet we will provide okay. to yeah. Ms. Feller. To Thank you so here. much. Uh, and um, before we close, I want to give way to our executive director uh, for any comments or whatever that you may have. Oh, and then I just thought, Commissioner, I'm sorry, Commissioner, because that was a great point, uh, that we do want to provide space for any public comments at this point, if someone would have so. Yes, sir, Mr. Gooch, Campbell Gooch. Three minutes is perfectly fine. And uh, first, I want to say thank you, everybody, for uh, having this. I think this has been a great opportunity to share and mind and put our minds together about an, an issue so um, central to Nashville. My name is Jamel Campbell Gooch. I'm a community organizer. I work every day with community members on this issue. And the things that I have to say are just facts to clear up a lot of things I think were said and some people mentioned. Um, one, if you ask any police officer captain, they will tell you that poverty is attached to crime, right? Things like poverty, health, homelessness are major drivers of crime. And so simply, people are poor because they do not have money. People are houseless because they do not have homes. And people are sick because they do not have health care. But what our system does is it solves those issues by throwing police at it. So when we talk about redefining public safety, I think there are a couple things that are happening both globally, nationally, um, in this conversation to actually fix these issues of poverty. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk and just lay out some facts. Uh, for every $100 spent out of our general fund, Nashville spends $36 on policing and caging individuals. MMPD currently has 94 unfilled positions that cost us $99.2 million. And 99% of the calls of service are nonviolent, not including a weapon. Only 1% of calls are potentially violent. And so when I say these things, I think when we have this discussion around redefining public safety, a lot of the times, because of bloated police budgets and our enormous investment over the years in policing, police take the center stage with this. So, but when we talk about redefining public safety, I think there's a couple things we need to consider. A guaranteed basic income, where community members get unrestricted cash, housing subsidies, rent freezes, universal health care. And when we actually think about these solutions that actually solve the drivers of crime, then what we actually end up is with the real resource communities that make police irrelevant. And so I would suggest um, both this commission and anyone that is interested in this conversation pull together community organizers who are at the frontier of advocating for more access to health care, more access to housing, more access to non-police alternatives to police that's mending our conflicts, and create a robust report and vision for what Nashville looks like where the conditions that drive police or the need for police are not relevant anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gooch. Anyone else that loves to make a public comment? Not seeing none. Again, I'll go back to our executive director. And I'd like to thank uh, our executive director and her entire staff for reaching out, pulling all this together, making it do what it do, and the commissioners 
who took of their own time to get here when they could and to be involved and engaged in this. And to you, the public, who came to give your time. Uh, as the Metro Human Relations Commission, I'm always intrigued by the mission that's set out by the ordinance that the mission of the Metro Human Relations Commission is to protect and promote the personal dignity, peace, safety, security, health, and general welfare of all people in Nashville and Davidson County. That is a lofty mission, and I'm glad to be associated with so many individuals who are committed to us making our contribution to make Nashville a much more just and equitable place. On November 15th, we this grew into two hearings. So on November 15th, we will have the B part to reimagining public safety colon beyond policing. And we really want to be able to take all of your information, generate reports that will be made available, not only to the general public, but to the mayor's office and the Metro Council, particularly in light that budget season has begun. If you noticed on the other day, the mayor has released a portion of his budget in the capital improvements, and that we need this information and we need to continue to seek to help Nashville be better. So I'm grateful again to the commissioners and to all of you, and we will consider ourselves adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.